Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. You know, we're living in a time that's defined by its actions. Often an apparent lack of results when it comes to the mindset and behavior of those in our society. When you look at actions, what drives those actions? Whether it be your actions or the actions of others, oftentimes our system deals with the actions. What we see, what we can define, what we can review, what we can approach, what we can identify. What if I told you that the actions weren't necessarily the most appropriate aspect to deal with. We see actions that are put forward in a negative sense. And yet there are those who have chosen not to deal with those actions as we would deem appropriate. In other words, it's a lot easier to get away with things now than it used to be, is it not? Maybe you can remember, like me, the times when as a child you were, you were quite confident that you weren't going to get away with something if you got caught. The trick was what? Don't get caught. Now it doesn't matter if you get caught. Not in all cases. The reality is we look at that and we make a determination. Many people don't feel like that, that that system, that that approach is going to be helpful in the long run because it's definitely not helpful in the short term. But what we have to begin to realize is it's not just about the actions. The actions are merely a byproduct that we see. So how do we deal with the actions? Or what if we were to set the actions aside? Approach it, as many might say today, just leave it alone. Let it take care of itself. Will it ever take care of itself? Man, for some reason, is inherently prone to react in the wrong manner. With exceptions with changes in their life and their behavior. But what changes the actions? Because we have been conditioned to say that the consequences change the actions. Is that true? That's the way it's designed. That's the way it should work. You would hope that when something is done wrong and someone is punished, that they've learned their lesson and they don't do it again. I, I wasn't the type of child who desired to get in trouble for the same thing over and over and over again. But I know some that are. Because they're going to do what they want to do, no matter whether it's right or wrong, as long as they feel like it's right, as long as they feel it's, we call it bullheaded, don't we? You're just bullheaded. Will you never learn? The answer would likely be probably not. And you meet some adults who you say, you must have been a bullheaded child because they haven't changed. And they are still bullheaded and they are still immature. And they continue on in the way of their own choosing. Bible says they did that which was right in their own eyes, and that seems to sum up a lot of people today, doesn't it? Met a little girl in the store the other day, and the, the sign was up there, and the announcement had been made multiple times, don't open the boxes. You have to figure it out from the barcode or what's written on the box or whatever, but you're not supposed to open the box because the box gets open and the stuff gets spread all over the place. This little girl was made aware that she shouldn't be opening the boxes, and as she continued to open the boxes, she threw out a flippant, well, okay, and just continued. So she was told again, don't open the boxes. She went and found another box. Went and found a friend to open boxes with her. 
Finally, they came and they said, if you do one more box, we're going to ask you and your group to leave. Now, the interesting thing was there was a parent standing there helping her open the boxes, listening to the conversation, and then got mad because someone dared approach their child in such a disrespectful manner. And I stood there, I wish I could say in awe, but I stood there recognizing that's not that uncommon anymore. So again, the question is, how do we stop the disrespect? How do we stop the improper actions? How do we stop the mentality that we see? You know, there's a lot of ideas out there. There's a lot of suggestions. There's a lot of shrugging of the shoulders, I don't know. Because many people don't feel like they can get satisfaction. They don't demonstrate stability. And it seems like the harder they try, the more they fail. All of those are the excuses that seem to develop in our society today. What we have to begin to do is look at what motivates. What motivates the actions? What motivates the lack of respect? What motivates a literal change in the shift of a godly mentality? You know, there's not many people asking that question. They want to know why things are as they are, but they never drill down. We answer difficult questions with simple answers. We hear a lot of, I don't know, responses. They do know. And the excuse that, well, I can't be perfect doesn't hold water. But we have become a society of excuses. Entitlement breeding excuses. This is what I deserve. This is what you owe me. This is what I should get. All the way down to the base foundation of our homes. Children now telling their parents what they're going to do. It's interesting and would be interesting to see the statistics on at what time that that generational gap began to allow that. Almost as if the parents sat down and said, okay, just tell me what you want and I'll go do it. Because if you've seen a couple of children light up over something that their parent chose not to do for them, it's an interesting sight to behold. But how many times do we, in the same vein of reaction, approach God in much the same way? We look at the actions of our lives in comparison to how we look at society. And we don't understand the people that see themselves as okay and acceptable in their bad behavior. Who ask, why should I be punished? Why can't I just do what I want? And we look upon those people with a, a certain disdain, a, a confusion. Why do you not understand that that's not right? You've been told, just like this child in the store, you've been told, your parents have been told. Why did the parent not stop in and say, you are not going to do that. Look at this sign. Listen to what these people are telling you. Or what, you're going to go over there and sit down for a while. Or you're going to go to the car. Or you're going to lose your, your play toys. Whatever it is. But how many times do we fail to follow what God has told us to do? We demonstrate poor behavior, bad choices, and bad decisions. And yet, it's much the same reaction. We think it's all about the actions. And then there are those who reach a point in their life where they say, I need to change my actions, but how do I do it? You have to change your motivation. You have to change what rules in your heart. You have to change your desire because with the improper motivation, the improper desire, you're never going to do, you're never going to want to do what God wants you to do. 
the motivation to drive is from your core. The, the motivation that drives your actions. So what does that tell us about our hearts? You know, we can ultimately provide enough consequences that someone should write their behavior. But does writing the behavior count as the end result? Stop and think about that for a minute. If I can correct the behavior, have I accomplished what I need to accomplish? The answer is no. Because the behavior can be repeated. Because the behavior can be adjusted. We've all heard the, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. The behavior was adjusted to fit a momentary need. So what in our lives continues to stand on the inside? What is those things that we see in Scripture that God commands? We're going to kind of go through an English lesson here in a minute because we're going to see just exactly how the Bible puts it. It's not left to a question. It's not left to an understanding. It's a statement. But too often, we don't address the problems fully because we don't address the motivation completely. And they're not approached honestly, especially when it comes to our self-analysis. The ability to look at what we do, why we do it, and what motivates us to do it. We fall short because we again provide simple answers to difficult questions. We've asked a question to someone else and they've given us a short answer and we recognize that answer as one just to be fluid enough to get through it. Just get me through this conversation. I'll tell you whatever you want, but we're not going to go into depth. And the more that you drive to go deeper, the more difficult the conversation gets. One of the greatest acts of harm that we can commit is a lack of honesty. Without that honesty, that honest assessment of yourself, we can easily and honestly assess those around us, can't we? We'll even tell somebody this old phrase, let me be honest with you. Let me be honest with you. As if that's truly a phrase of a request. Can I please be honest with you? Knowing that most people aren't going to look and go, no, you can't. I don't want you to be honest with me. I'm not interested in what you got to say. So why don't we just save it and move on along? You know, that's dangerous. And one of the dangers is being afraid to let someone be honest with you. It's almost like the student who was asked the question during an exam. How close are you to the right answer? The student replied, about two seats. He was being honest. That's, that's what he thought about it. He, he wasn't really concerned in what the teacher had to ask. But those that aren't able to be honest with themselves are going to struggle with being honest in regards to what's going to fix the depth of their need. They would look and in some cases say, honestly, I'm doing better, right? Honestly, I don't understand what your problem is. Let me be honest with you. I, I think you're asking too much. And there are many who look at God's word that way. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. These verses are full of truth. And, and they're a stair step and a guideline to how we fix the deeper problem. 
that one of desire, that one of motivation. We, we have to step aside today from simply looking at our actions. The, the thing is, is there's not many people out there telling us today to do that. They're content if the problem goes away because the problem isn't based on the need of the person. The problem is based on how badly it impacts the life of the one who is discouraged with the problem, who's disappointed with the person. I need you to make your problem go away so I can have some peace in my life. When we look at society, is that not what we want? I want you to fix the music. I want you to fix the gunshots. I want you to fix the fast cars. I want you to fix the, the system because it's making my life miserable. Is that really our purpose? Have we lost concern for what's really right and why it's really right? Or is it all just about us? Now we can again sidestep it a little bit and say, well, it has to be about them because it is about me. And it's my responsibility to do this and this and this. It is your responsibility, but what is your motivation in your responsibility? Is the motivation to get them to do right because they need to and it's going to impact them? Because it's not what God would have them to do? The first step we see here is, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. There are a lot of people who, who don't understand salvation, who don't care about salvation, who don't believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that He died on the cross for their sins. They feel like they're good in and of themselves. They don't have anything that they need to fix. And if they do, they'll fix it themselves. If you can fix it yourself, why does it keep happening? Because that can only mean one thing. Maybe two things. Number one, the truth is you can't fix it yourself. And the other one is maybe you don't want to fix it. You just want to get past the problem. There's no thought about the next time. There's no thought about the problem that it's going to impact the next time. It's just get me through this time. Get me through this lecture. Get me through this consequence. They don't even necessarily think tomorrow will be different because they've repeated the behavior so much that they know it's not going to be different. They just tired of listening. You see, there's... I told you English class was coming. So I could give you a little quiz here and ask you if you remember what a verb is. There's a verb here that is in what we call the indicative form. Indicative simply means that it's going to make a statement or ask a question. When you begin to look at this verb, it says you have received him. You see, the question goes along with the statement. This is speaking to those who have received Christ as their Savior. But one of the, the main things that we have to consider, and likely the most important thing that we have to consider, is where are you starting from in order to change your motivation and your desire? If it doesn't include the Lord, guess what? You're going to get on a hamster wheel that is just going to run you around in circles as fast as your little legs will carry you. We don't have the ability to simply just fix ourselves. And again, if you disagree with that, then ask yourself the question, how many repetitive times have you dealt with the same issue? And again, it means either I have become satisfied with it, I've given up, or I don't care. But it's not about the action. It's about the source of your strength. Then there's an imperative verb. This is a, a verb that goes beyond just the statement. It actually makes a command. When you see this, this next phrase, so walk ye in him. That's not a request. 
We say something is important, and if we feel it to be vitally important, we say it is what? It is imperative. That's what this statement is saying. It is imperative. It's not a suggestion. It's not a great idea. It's imperative that you walk in Him, because in Him is your strength. And there are too many people that want to leave out this part. They're satisfied to say, I'm a Christian. I asked this morning in Sunday school, how many people see Christ in you? We can walk around with the name Christian on our, on our backs, on our t-shirt. But is it necessary? Shouldn't somebody be able to see it without it written all over you? Hear it in your voice, see it in your response, see it in your compassion. But again, those are all actions, aren't they? And how do we get to those actions? We backtrack. As ye have received Christ. First step, making a, a statement, providing knowledge, this is a fact. But then it goes a step farther. I'm going to tell you how you need to do that. I'm going to tell you that you have to walk in Him. Then you look at another part of speech called a participle. It has the same characteristics of a verb or an adjective. It clarifies, if you will. So that's what we begin to see next. Rooted and built up and established in the faith as you have been taught. I told you these verses were full. A step-by-step -step process to how you change your actions by changing your desires. The question is, are you interested? We go all the way back to verse 3 and it talks about the knowledge. Called the treasure, treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. They're found where? They're found in Christ which adds clarity to the fact that as ye have therefore received Christ. How do I change? I change through my wisdom. I change through my understanding of what God would have me to do. And that changes my desire. As I begin to know God, I begin to understand more. I begin to ask Him for the wisdom to do what I should do. In order to do what I should do, I have to change who I am. As ye have. It's a comparative statement. Are we comparing? It says, like a tree. This tree is, is living. That's what rooted means, like a tree. Established means like a house on a foundation. It's being built. It's a building process. So first you establish, where does all the life in a plant come from? Where does it draw its strength and its stability? From its roots. Too many people have forgotten their roots. They forgot that this is what it meant to look into the Bible. To rely on God for strength. For the very aspect of life. You see, multitudes of people are living lives void of God. Some partially, some completely. Some just enough to get by. Spurgeon once saw a weather vane. It was sitting on top of a barn and the weather vane had the words on it that said, God is love. Spurgeon looked at his companion and he said, I don't think I agree with that. Because the weather vane moves, that means God can change. His friend smiled slightly and looked back. He said, oh, but you misunderstand. What it means is that God is love no matter what the direction. No matter which way the wind blows... But how many people are living their lives void of that understanding? Turn over, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When you realize what it means to be established here, you have to realize that God has to be an integral part of your life. 
Many people are walking around saying God doesn't care. God does care. It's you who don't care to go looking for God. Who have determined that you have set the course for your life and it's your decision. Not only must we rely on God, but the Word. Where do we gain a greater understanding of God? It's through His Word. Where do we gain the teaching and the wisdom that we just mentioned? Through the Word of God. So when we fail to get into the Word of God, we fail to be motivated to do so. We fail in so many ways. But again, how our motivation and our desire drives our actions is, are we motivated to get into God's Word? Or do we say, why should I be motivated? I believe in God. I know who God is. The way you get to know God is through His Word. Again, we refer to the wisdom and the treasures of understanding. Where is it rooted? In God. How does God communicate with us? A little child wrote, God, are you really invisible or is it just a trick? And that's the way that a lot of people feel. God, where are you? I, I thought you said this. I thought you promised this. I thought my life was going to be this. But they have no desire to get into the Word. Which demonstrates that they're very much so lacks a desire to know more about God. How do you want to know more about God? What are you going to do to know more about God? Because many people who are making those statements have been making those statements for the better part of their life. So why hasn't it changed through the better part of your life? And what makes you think that instantaneously you're going to be blessed with all the knowledge of God and who He is? God wants you to know who He is so that he can, you can understand why the motivation is important. To produce the actions that will tell others of God's ability to change their lives as well. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. We see in our, our text where we are to be built and established. Christ is that foundation that we are to build upon. What are you building on today? Because if Christ isn't that foundation, everything else we see a parable of two men who built one on the rock and one on the sand. The one on the sand had no permanent foundation, had no hope for that foundation. And you would question, why build a foundation for a building that you want to last on an improper foundation base? The sand's not going to stay, but the rock will. What are you building your foundation on today? What's motivating you as you build? Where are you drawing your strength from? This word established means firm, stable, fast. Not letting go. How many people have let go over time? There was a point in their life when, when they were strong and they had the desire and they had the motivation and their actions were demonstrated by such. People would look and say, that is a godly individual. But over time, it's, it's been lost. It's been set aside. It's been allowed to, to rot. How many people live in a house that they know has some difficulties? Maybe a little, a little dirt in a corner. Well, cleaning the dirt in the corner is up pretty easy, is it not? if you're motivated to do it. Because if you leave the dirt in the corner, the dirt spreads a little farther, doesn't it? Or you can be worried about the dirt in the corner and forget about the wood that's rotten in the wall. And maybe because it's hidden in the wall, you're not looking at it so much, and, well, you've got a little bit of a foundation crack started. but you're content to just worry about the dirt in the corner. You know, that's a really good picture of life. Everybody's messing with the dirt in the corner. The most unimportant, the most unfoundational principle, 
Those are our actions, that dirt in the corner. What we're not supposed to do. So we think if, the, if company's coming over and we run sweep that dirt up real quick, everything's good. Not going to do you any good if the house falls down around your company. But we don't look at life that way, do we? It's just about sweeping up the dirt. It's just about looking good, keeping clean, letting everybody see what we want them to see. The motivation shouldn't be about what they see. It should be about who you are. Not only being established, but then we see the results. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Overflowing with thanksgiving. Why aren't my actions right? Because my motivation and my desire is wrong. Why do I not feel satisfied in my life? Because you're not overwhelmed with thanksgiving. Because in order to be overwhelmed with thanksgiving, you have to have a better understanding of the God that you refuse to get better acquainted with. And once that acquaintance deepens and it becomes a relationship and it becomes a friendship and it becomes an honor for the God who sent His Son to die for you, then you realize what all you have to be thankful for. And how little we recognize that thanks. Because it's not our motivation. So you see how it all begins with understanding God. How many people are living their lives going, well, I can't understand God. I don't know who God is. Everybody that I thought that would live like God, they, they failed me. There's nothing in that verse in our text in Colossians that spoke about understanding others, relying on others, holding others up on a pedestal, because that is a common response that I hear. Oh, well, I knew somebody one time said they were a Christian, and you ought to see them now. Why, why they're, I, I think the church would fall down if they walked back into church. And because of that person, I'm not going to go back to church. Well, number one, it's not about church. It's about the God of the church. But if you're going to extend not going to the church to mean I'm not going to have anything to do with God, then you're going to have a hard time. The question is, are you content to sweep up the dirt? to deal with just your actions? Or are you ready to change your heart? We call it repentance. And a lot of people don't like that word. Repent, that means I'm wrong. Yeah, it sure does. But I'm a Christian. You can't tell me I'm wrong. God did. Why else would we need to ask for forgiveness? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And to do what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we're so good, or why do we need forgiveness? If God expects perfection, why would He put that clause in there, if you will? Because He knows that you're going to need forgiveness. He knows that He's willing to forgive but you've got to drill down a little bit. What is my motivation? What's going to give me lasting results? You ever get tired of that person that just keeps coming back, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry? And, and it moves from I'm sorry to I'm going to change. And you know what your thoughts are saying, what your mind has put forward? Yeah, all right. Okay. Those type of people get on our nerves, don't they? Well, that doesn't sound like love and compassion, but it's honest, isn't it? We don't appreciate it. We want them to see the lie that's coming out of their mouth. And we just don't understand. 
I mean, if I was that person and I had done that so many times, I would be different. Then you look to God and you explain why you keep doing what you're doing. Because it's the same thing. But we've never looked on it with the disdain that we look upon others. And the reality is, is those that we look on with disdain, they look on themselves the same way we look on us. There's some method to our madness that says, I'll get it next time. Or I've failed, so there's no sense trying anymore. Or God understands. I'm going to ask you a really blunt question. When do you think a holy God is ever going to understand and accept any act of sin? He's not. And you can make your excuses all day long. And you can point your finger at others in comparison. You can even point it to the preacher and say, you know what? You're not perfect and oh, I know it. And oh, I know other people that know I'm not perfect too. There is none righteous. No, not one. The question is not what somebody else is. It's who you are. If you bow your heads, close your eyes. Are we willing this morning to take an honest assessment? Not of our actions, but of our motivation. Of the desire that drives the motivation. Because if you simply concentrate on your actions, I can promise you, you are going to continue to fall shorter and shorter of the mark. You're going to grow discouraged. You're going to want to give up. But stop and consider what life with God's being pleased as your motivation, your prime desire. And think how that would change your life. Didn't say it was going to make you perfect. But my final question is this. If you're going to please God, how well do you know God? You see, we're all full of facts. We all have a certain level of knowledge that we've acquired. How much knowledge of God have you acquired that will change your base desire? Maybe you're here this morning and that, that first phrase held you up. I haven't received Christ. I, I haven't ever prayed that prayer that said, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. And I realize that you died on the cross for me as the Son of God. And you shed your blood. And I accept that as a sacrifice for my sin. I want you to take control of my life. Or maybe you have. But you've failed to hold on to that in a way that makes you more than you are. Each week we're faced with a decision at this time. In the old days it was the decision to, to walk out and go to the altar. Our altars stand empty often. But even at that, going to the altar is merely an action. It was the motivation that drove someone to the altar. I heard Lester Roloff say one time, we, we tell people to slip out, slip out, slip down the aisle. He said, gone are the days when people pushed their way out because they had to get to the aisle. They had to run down that aisle to get to that altar. It's not just about the altar. 
even though it holds great importance. But it is all about your heart. Is today the day that that changes? God becomes real. Life becomes renewed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are a God that we can know, that we can trust, who is unchangeable. And Lord, we just pray that we would renew our desire, that we could still yet see revival, that we could see souls saved once again. But Lord, the motivation seems to be at a standstill in many cases. It's something that many pray for but seldom want to accomplish. Let someone else do that. Now, I'll be glad when it does, but let them, let them do it. Lord, we pray that you would use your word this morning to convict hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. To be established, to, build, to be built, and to be rooted. How strong are your roots this morning?